This documentary follows my family and how we cope almost four years after the brutal homicide of my aunt Natalie, murdered by a man she once trusted. Our family is left with the consequences. Picture a life destroyed, a family broken. Picture how we live now. This is domestic abuse, the aftermath. Natalie suffered at the hands of a domestic abuser in a relationship which would eventually lead to her death. One of the reasons I decided to do this documentary is because I feel myself have difficulties handling grief and struggle with my emotions. I feel that this is because of what has happened to our family and it will be interesting to see if Kirsty, Natalie's eldest, feels the same. In 2016, the year of Natalie's death, over 150 people lost their lives due to domestic abuse, although we believe the figures are much higher. By telling my family's story and how we cope, I hope it gives families or any of the one plus million individuals affected by domestic abuse the hope that surviving is possible, but it's something that we will have to work on for the rest of our lives. This is the brutal story of how a family cope after domestic abuse. So we're driving to where my nan and my auntie are buried. It's only about five minutes away from the house, so... But I haven't visited the grave since February, so it needs a bit of a clean and stuff. So that's the job I've been given by my auntie. Yeah, this is where my nan and my auntie are buried. Uh, it just needs a bit of cleaning up because everything's disintegrating because they've been in for so long. It's pretty nice being back here because it makes you feel like you know you're with like the people that you love. And especially like the last thing that my nan said to me before she died was that the only thing she ever wanted was to be with Natalie, and that's exactly what she's got. So. I don't get to visit it very often, so it's nice to go down and uh, and see it. In 2016, our family was involved in a BAFTA-nominated documentary called Catching a Killer, which aired on Channel 4. We were sadly involved in that documentary because it followed the police investigation into my sister's murder. In May 2016, my youngest sister Natalie Hemming was murdered by her ex-partner in the family home whilst the three children slept upstairs. Uh, initially, Natalie was classed as a missing person. For three weeks, one of the biggest manhunts, uh, sorry, searches in Thames Valley Police history was carried out uh, while they looked for Natalie. Sadly, her body was found in Woodland um, on the 22nd of May. When we got down to my mum's house and the police were there and they were talking to us and saying, that obviously Natalie was missing and that they'd arrested him on suspicion of murder. It was like I was sitting on the outside looking in on somebody else's family being told all of this. It didn't feel real at all that it had happened to our family and I think until Natalie was actually found, you know, that was a point that I think it all hit home for all of us through that something had happened, do you know, and that we probably wouldn't see Natalie again. But I don't think you ever want to believe it until somebody actually says to you, no, she's been found. Well, it was when I, even though no one had told me that it had definitely happened, where it was the morning when I woke up and the police were in the house. Um, that's when I knew something had happened and at that point I was I was scared um, but like I don't know I, I was just I was scared but I was unsure of whether I should be scared 
always though I shouldn't. We only told the two older children because the youngest was too young to even understand what was going on. So she was off with mum having a, a milkshake, I think, or something like that, and a biscuit. And we were, we sat the older two children down and we kind of told them that mummy was missing and that daddy had had to go to the police station to help them with their investigations because at this point we didn't have any more to tell them apart from he was there helping the police. Um, so Joanne told me, it was the next morning, um, she told me what like that there was a police investigation that um, her partner had been arrested um, on suspicion of doing something to her because she was a missing person um, and at that point I was the, un the, une the unease it went away because I knew that obviously something had definitely happened and that he was most likely responsible for what happened um, and it it made me scared for my future as well because at that point I was thinking what if I never saw my mum again that sort of stuff and something that I do when I go to conferences is that I ask everybody in the room to, to write a list of things as adults that are really important to them. Um, my list has got things like my children, my husband, you know, my home, the dogs, the, you, things that you, they are, you know, your health, your job, they're, they're all the usual sort of answers. But then I say to them, okay, so you wake up tomorrow morning and all of that is gone because that's what happened for these children. They went to bed on um, Monday night, uh, sorry, on Tuesday night, and Wednesday morning, they got up and everything was gone. Their home, their mum, their dad, the dog, their clothes, their toys, everything was gone. Um, and I don't, think as I, I don't think anybody really can imagine what that must have felt like for them. Physical um, abuse, um, coercive and controlling behaviour, financial abuse um, and various other aspects um, that make up domestic abuse. Well, it's something that I wouldn't want any other family to have to go through. Um, I think it destroys lives, destroys relationships. It's just, it's heartbreaking really. <laughs> I think the true figures um, will never really no. Um, the statistics tell us that two women and one man a week um, die because of domestic abuse. Uh, now they're looking at the number of um, suicides that um, may be um, implicated with domestic abuse. So um, the figures are extraordinary in, in terms of the numbers of people that are affected but I, I don't think it even comes close to the, the, the real amount. The perpetrator is now serving a minimum of 20 years for Natalie's murder. Uh, Natalie suffered for about 10 years at this man's hands. He um, controlled every, um, every action, every movement and everything about hers and the children's lives. So he'd um, tell her when and when she can and can't go out. Um, she'd tell uh, he'd hit her and um, he'd throw things at her. He was very clever that he would cry at the right moments when the jury would be looking at him when he was asked certain questions. Um, he would, um, you know, give all the right kind of motions to, to what they would expect him to do um, but when he was actually convicted of Natalie's murder um, he actually mouthed to my brother Sean I enjoyed every minute of it as they took him from the dock. I, th I think it was just at first it was just a bit of 
emptiness, like I didn't have any feeling towards it, but then as I managed to be able to open up about it, I went through the emotions of grief, sadness, um, that sort of stuff. Um, for a long time, it kind of tore us all apart, really. Like, it just, we went from having a stable family to my mum not being around and having to take a lot of responsibility for the younger kids. Um, yeah, it, it was not a nice experience. Natalie's funeral as it actually wasn't until the 4th of July on 2016 um, because she had to have autopsies and everything done to try and confirm a cause of death. She was in the elements so long they can't give us a definitive answer of what actually killed her. It affected everyone in the family. Um, me personally, I, at first I wasn't very open about you know how it affected me but then I got I, I gained confidence and I opened up about it to my family and I managed to talk about it and now I feel like I'm a more confident person than what I was um, for other people in the family um, I'm not really sure how it affected them but everyone has a own way of coping with things I think we've always said that we deal with things quite differently because we're ex-military so yes it's happened but we had to kind of put our military heads on and it had to go to the back of your head because we now had three more children amongst our own children that had to be looked after as well as our own. So even though this horrible thing has happened, you have to carry on, do you know? You've got children that depend on you and if you are a mess sitting in the corner and can't cope, then who's gonna look after them? Natalie's murder has massively uh, changed our family dynamic and um, I, I don't think you ever get over it, I think you just learn to live with it. That's probably the best way of putting it. So, you know, there'll always be this massive Natalie shaped hole in our lives and you know, three children have lost their mum. And all of us have had to make huge changes to accommodate what, you know, what has happened because of one person's actions. You take a life, it should be a life, do you know? Not saying that we should have the death penalty back in this country, but he should never get out of prison, never. He should spend the rest of his life there. Because what he's done is he's not just destroyed his own family unit, he's destroyed the whole of our family, do you know? Now, do you know, every year we have to go through Natalie's birthday, Christmas is without her, do you know, and it's, it gets a bit easier every year, but you'll never change the way you feel because obviously it's like she'll never see her children grow up, she'll never see her daughters get married, she'll never see her grandchildren, do you know, and me and Jo now get all of those things that she should. She'll be the one here seeing it all, not us. You know, it's sorry. Um, it's it's hard because, you know, her son now calls me mum. You know, and it shouldn't be me that's being called mum. It should be her. Many uh, victims of domestic abuse don't even realise that they are victims of domestic abuse. I know I didn't. Not until. Not until this happened to Natalie and I started to research this stuff and really start to understand all of this stuff did it suddenly dawn on me that actually, yeah, I knew this relationship wasn't right, but I wouldn't have labelled it as domestic abuse because he didn't, he didn't beat me, but he controlled every aspect of my life. If you're in an abusive relationship, it's not the easiest thing to talk to someone about. Um, but if you do feel confident enough, then you should tell someone in high power that can actually do something and they will obviously help you get out of the situation that you're in if you feel like you need to escape from that. I think definitely reaching out to the people that can help you, your friends, your family, even charities that are there specifically to help victims of domestic abuse.
Leaving an abusive relationship is incredibly difficult and incredibly dangerous and what I would say to anybody who either knows somebody or or thinks they may be living in that sort of situation is you have to seek advice from professionals. The point at which Natalie had decided to leave, the chances of homicide increased to by 90%. And if you don't know that, that you know, you are physically making that decision to leave actually increases the chances that you're gonna end up being murdered.